Namaskar and welcome all to this festival of Srishti Samrama 2020. It is a celebration of the Earth Mother, as she is called by many indigenous people. And here in the Indian ethos, we call her Bhu Devi, Bhumi Devi, Vasudha, and many other names that we address her by. We just saw a video made by uh, none other than Ricky Cage. And uh, it brings to mind what's, what we say in our own Indian ethos that, you know, everything that is in creation is divine. Be it animals, be it humans, be it uh, the uh, mountains or the rivers, everything is divine. And uh, that is the respect that we have to give to everything around us. But some of the images there were really um, saddening because uh, somewhere we have lost the handbook of instructions about how we have to live in peace, in sync with mother nature and everything around us. So I think it is high time that we all started opening our handbook of life because somewhere we have forgotten how to live in peace and in sync with everything around us. Srishti Samrama is a festival that started about 10 years ago. It is a festival, a flagship festival of the Heritage Trust and always supported by the BNMIT institutions. And this time, uh, since... Uh, the pandemic has taken the world over. We have to celebrate it virtually. And so it's been brought to you by the Center for Soft Power in collaboration with Heritage Trust, with uh, the BNMIT, of course, and then the artists for uh, the artists for wildlife. Uh, and then uh, the um, Wildlife Trust of India then the uh, International Center for Cultural Studies. I think I've covered all our uh, collaborators. And of course, the uh, I cannot miss, and he's right here, the uh, Deputy High Commission of the uh, British uh, Consulate, and he's sitting right here with us. And uh, I welcome all of you, and it's been wonderful working with you. And for this section, I should say that we have had uh, James and... Uh, Ishwar Mane, uh, I, I remember, you know, some time back I said uh, something from the Merchant of Venice to James and uh, he's taken that very seriously and uh, this whole thing has come together because of all the work that these two people have done. And uh, having said that, I would first like to invite uh, Ricky Cage to say a few words and let me just give you a brief introduction because I, if I give the whole introduction, it will occupy a lot of time. Uh, Ricky Cage is a Grammy Award winner. He's the U.S. Billboard number one artist, the UNESCO MGIEP ambassador, and UNICEF celebrity supporter. Ricky Cage is an internationally renowned Indian music composer, environmentalist, and professor. Ricky Cage has dedicated his life and music to creating awareness on the environment and positive social impact. He has performed at prestigious venues in over 30 countries, including at the United Nations headquarters in New York and Geneva. Ricky Cage composed and produced his album Shanti Samsara, which was launched by our own Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the French President Francois Hollande at the United Nations COP21 Climate Change Conference in Paris. For Shanti Samsara, Ricky collaborated with over 500 musicians from 40 countries. His past repertoire of work includes 16 studio albums released internationally over 3,500 commercials and four feature films, including the natural history documentary, Wild Karnataka, narrated by Sir David Attenborough. He scored music for the opening ceremony of the Cricket World Cup 2011 held in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And I welcome you all once again to this session where we have called it Shutterbugs in the Wild. So on to you, uh, Ricky, for your uh, few words. Thank you so much for that uh, rather detailed uh, introduction. Thank you so much. And a uh, huge honor for me to be here. Uh, very grateful to you, ma'am, for inviting me to speak over here. So as, we, as I was introduced, I'm Ricky. I'm a musician. I'm an environmentalist. Uh, two pillars that have pretty much dictated my whole life and uh, every single life decision of mine. 
And uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about my journey getting to this uh, because the only kind of music that I make is about the environment and about sustainability. So I just wanted to speak about how I actually arrived here. Now, uh, so basically ever since I remember, as I mentioned, I've always been a musician and an environmentalist. And, uh, you know, uh, even as a child, uh, while my classmates and, uh, you know, while my classmates in my first grade or second grade, while they were very obsessed by television and, uh, you know, watching cartoons and watching and playing video games, I was very obsessed with my music system. So always my ears were always more important than my eyes. And uh, I used to listen to a whole lot of music. I used to try to decipher every piece of music, try to understand who the musicians are, what kind of cultures they come from, what kind of instruments they play, what do the lyrics mean, what are they thinking while they write these songs. So a lot of my education has happened through music. And, uh, uh, you know, and it's through music that I found a very deep connect with nature. And it's very difficult for me to explain that. Uh, but, you know, for me, music and nature has always been one and the same. Of course, now I can explain that in a little better way, you know, as I've grown older, because, you know, you understand that how did music start? Music started off as sounds from within nature, you know, sounds of the birds, sounds of the animals, sounds of the trees, sounds of the wind, uh, you know, the sounds of the river flowing. And then later on, it became humans trying to imitate those sounds. And then later on, pulling objects from within nature and creating musical instruments. And then it's only for the last few hundred years that music has actually become you know, academic with notes and scales and rags and things like that. But, but music is nature. And if you look at indigenous populations all over the world, for them, music has always been not only, uh, uh, not only sounds of nature, but also singing and speaking about nature. So music and nature for me has always been one and the same. And growing up also, I have to admit that I've always been a very weird child because, uh, you know, I grew up, uh, I did not grow up in India for the first eight years of my life. I was in North Carolina in America and, uh, you know, I've lived in a very, uh, very remote area. My parents uh, and I, uh, my parents and I lived in a very remote area and, you know, there was a forest behind our home and, you know, it was a very common occurrence of snakes and creepy crawly, uh, you know, so-called creepy crawly uh, uh, animals uh, getting into our home. And while my, uh, while my friends and while my parents used to run away from these animals and even warn me about them, you know, I was very drawn towards uh, them and I would try to look into their eyes, try to see personality in every single animal. And for me, it's never been, you know, their world and my world. For, uh, it's, it's always been our world. And, you know, and while people used to warn me that they're such dangerous animals, you know, they, you should stay away from them. And while cartoons used to actually vilify these animals, you know, like snakes were always the villains in these, anim in these cartoons and, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, reptiles and lizards were always the villains. I always used to wonder that why do they exist if, you know, if they are villains and, and of course, later on, I realized that every single part, uh, every single animal, no matter how seemingly insignificant or seemingly horrific they are, you know, they are very important parts of the ecosystem. And that's what I've tried to showcase through my music. So when I started off my musical career, this was uh, in 1998, when I was all of 18 years old, when I started off my musical career very professionally, uh, I started off doing a whole lot of commercials for television and radio. And in a span of about 12 or 13 years, I had done more than 3,500 commercials for everybody from Levi's to Lee to Airtel, Vodafone, uh, Air India, Lufthansa, you name the brand and their competitor. I was basically composing music for them in every part of the world. And I was working really hard. There were days when I was doing more than one commercial a day, sometimes even up to four commercials a day. And it sort of struck me after all these years of doing commercials that you know, that, uh, that music is such a powerful language that these big brands have understood that, you know, that they've understood it so much so that they are ready to spend a couple of thousand dollars on me to actually create a piece of music for them to actually sell a product. And not only that, they're ready to spend a few million dollars to actually air that music on television and radio. So they've understood that music is such a powerful language, not only for communicating a message, uh, which in their case is communicating a message of sales, but also for retaining that message deep in the consciousness of a listener. Like the songs that we learned during our childhood are songs that we never forget. The morals that we learn through those songs are morals that stick with us forever and pretty much dictate our whole lives. So that is when I thought that, you know, that, uh, you know, I was pretty ashamed that being a musician, I had not understood the power of music and I wasn't utilizing the power of music in a way that it should be. And that is when I stopped all forms of commercial music. And uh, I decided that every piece of music that comes out of my studio, of my fingers, of my head is going to be about positive social impact and about environmental consciousness. And that's the only kind of music that I'm going to make. And uh, that started off a new journey of mine. 
Now, uh, you know, uh, you know, with so many uh, problems in our world, you know, like especially the environmental problems like climate change and, you know, and uh, air pollution leading to climate change, you have uh, you have species extinction, deforestation, forest fires happening every single day and, uh, you know, plastics pollution. You have all these problems. I've always believed that the biggest threat, uh, the actual biggest threat to uh, the human species and to our own survival and our sustainability is the constant thought we have that somebody else will make a difference, you know, that we are always waiting for governments to make a difference. We're always waiting for intergovernmental bodies, for NGOs, for leaders, for corporations to make a difference. And we are constantly protesting for them to make a difference when the, when the, uh, when the truth is that, you know, that we have to look inwards for that because uh, the only way that, you know, that all these problems will be solved is by strong behavioral change and behavioral change is the most important thing. And, uh, you know, and uh, that's what I try to do with my music especially with my concerts that I perform all over the world to large audiences, which I call the ground up approach is what I try to do is that I try to empower every single person uh, to, to bring about incremental changes within their own lives in a small way and empower them that, you know, that you yourself, if you bring in the small changes, you know, you're, that's powerful enough, you know, and uh, you don't need to think about everything from a holistic point of view of like, you know, changing the world or, you know, or, uh, or uh, you know, how do I bring about a change in an entire community? All that you need to do is just bring about small incremental changes within your own lives. And, uh, you know, and that itself will be quite powerful. And, uh, you know, and when it comes to all these problems that I mentioned, you know, everybody, uh, ev I, I will go on a limb and say that everybody is aware of all these problems. Maybe not the specifics and maybe not the statistics and all that stuff, but every single person is aware about plastics. Everybody is aware of the damage, the damage that air pollution is causing. Everybody is sort of aware of climate change and, you know, and uh, stuff like that. But, you know, the golden question is not about how do we make everybody aware of things? Because as I say that, as I said that everybody's pretty much aware on the surface of like, you know, all the problems that we're facing. The golden question is how do we convert this awareness into action? You know, and that is what, uh, uh, that is what pretty much every organization talks about. How do we, convert all this awareness that people have into action. And I believe that music can be that very strong catalyst because you can give a hundred speeches to a person. You can throw a whole lot of scientific data at a person. But I believe that the, uh, not just musicians, but all artists, whether they're dancers, whether painters, sculptors, musicians, writers, filmmakers, all of us, basically we have to take the scientific data and take these speeches and sort of take these complex ideas and these complex thoughts and sort of simplify them through the language of art. And in my case, in the language of music and communicate this in an emotional way so that it does not hit people in the head, but it hits people, uh, uh, hits people through their heart. And, uh, you know, and that's the only way that we can convert um, uh, awareness uh, into action. And uh, as uh, uh, Vijayalakshmi ma'am said, you know, about, uh, about ancient culture, you know, and uh, indigenous populations like in India, we have, a, uh, we have a, a Sanskrit phrase, which is pretty much at the heart of our uh, traditions at the heart of our culture and spirituality. It's called Vasudhaiva Kutubakam, which literally means the world is one family uh, and coexistence in, in just a short way. Now, when we think about coexistence, when we think about Vasudhaiva Kutubakam, uh, for some reason, the only thing that comes to our mind nowadays is basically living in peace and harmony between Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Jews, Buddhists, Christians, uh, you know, Jains, basically different parts of the human race. Because somewhere along our journey, we have absolutely forgotten that we're not the only species on this planet. We're just one among millions and millions of species. And also adding on to what uh, Vijay Lakshmi ma'am said that, uh, you know, in fact, Mahatma Gandhi, whose birthday it was yesterday, he had actually said that, uh, you know, while translating, a, um, while translating a, uh, a Sanskrit phrase from the Vedas, he had actually said that, you know, that there is the divine in every single atom on this planet, whether that atom goes on to building something that is animate or inanimate. So basically coexistence not only has to be about, you know, living uh, in peace and harmony within us uh, humans, uh, which itself we are not doing very well, but it also has to be among all life. And as Mahatma Gandhi said, we have to go a step further where we have to coexist with all the inanimate objects, like, you know, that the land we walk on, the air we breathe, the water we drink, and that is a true coexistence. And that's what we need to showcase to everyone through our art and through our music. And we need to showcase to people that, you know, that somewhere along our journey, we humans have made a wrong turn and we need to come back and we need to understand that, you know, simple living, consuming less of everything, you know, that's what we need to do. Just consume less of everything that we are consuming 
and uh, you know and understanding that you know that we need to coexist for our own survival because our own survival depends upon coexisting with everything that is animate and inanimate so thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you and i'm very grateful for this for your time thank you so much uh, vikri uh, we are really happy that you have uh, taken the time to be with us today i will uh, now hand it over to varsha to introduce uh, the uh, persons who are going to carry on the rest of the uh, event today and uh, before i stop i would like to say one thing that uh, uh, what struck me with uh, the talk from the wisdom of the ancients yesterday was how almost every culture in the world lived totally in sync with nature and if you go back to our indian heritage our day starts with a prayer to mother earth and then to all the elements and then you do not eat till you feed the birds and this is how the day went on somewhere we have lost that connect and i sure hope we bring that back so over to you raj varsha thank you aunty good evening to one and all i am pleased to introduce our chair for this session mr james godber mr james godber is a diplomat he is currently working at the british deputy high commission in bengaluru having read environmental economics at the university of york uk he initially entered the uk civil service in the department for environment working on energy and climate policies he has since made a career in the foreign and commonwealth office serving in china and qatar as well as in london before coming to india in 2017 travel has enabled him to develop his photography and he is thrilled to have had, had the opportunity to experience india's natural environments as well as the culture and cities with this very brief introduction i will now hand over the session to james over to you james thank you varsha thank you vijayalakshmi uh, thank you everybody for joining us this evening here in india uh, this um, morning we can't hear you james let's change let's change vijayalakshmi let's try something different Can you hear me now? Better. Okay, I can't hear you. Let's work out how to turn these things on. Hang on, just one second. Hello, can you hear me now? Fantastic. Uh, so my name is James Godber, as Varsha just said, and uh, I'd like to first to start with a uh, thanks to Varsha and to Vijay Lakshmi for inviting me to uh, chair this evening's session. Uh, it's a real privilege on behalf of myself and my colleagues at the British Deputy High Commission here in Bangalore to have this opportunity. Um, as you've heard, I am an amateur photographer uh, as well as. Uh, a diplomat in terms of my profession uh, and um, I'm therefore very excited to have uh, been able to co-curate with uh, Professor Mane uh, the exhibition and I'm looking forward to introducing you to that with him later this evening. But before we move to the exhibition itself uh, we're going to have six short uh, think pieces, illustrative think pieces from some of the participants in the exhibition. Each exhibitor will uh, prevent, present their thoughts on uh, issues around the beauty that we see in the world around us from our back garden to places much further away. And I'm going to invite Professor Mane to go first. Varsha, we didn't coordinate. Are you formally introducing Professor Mane as you did me or am I introducing Professor Mane? Uh, James, you're introducing all your panelists. Fantastic! <laughs> That's what I hoped was going to happen. Right. Okay, <laughs> so Professor Ishwar Mane is a computer science engineer by profession, uh, where he imparts value-based education to students at the BNM Institute of Technology here in Bengaluru in South India. Uh, he is inclined towards nature photography and the outdoors in general, and studies about plot, excuse me, tropical plants and planted tank aquariums. Most recently, his photography has been restricted to butterflies, amphibians, serpents, 
and the occasional large mammal. And he's recently been focusing on documenting the butterflies around the Indian subcontinent, ranging from India through to Indonesia. All of his photographs of the butterflies, of which there are some in the exhibition, are clipped in their natural environment. He's photo documented close to 700 species and wishes to take that number to at least a thousand Indian butterfly species in the next few years. Without further ado, Professor Mane, over to you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, James, for the introduction. And thank you, uh, Vijayalakshmi, Auntie. I would like to call her Auntie because I've known her since my school age. And uh, we and Sri Ram, her son, studied together for uh, uh, the same school, in the same school for a long period of time. So thank you for the opportunity, uh, Vijayalakshmi, Auntie. And thank you, Heritage, for having me as a co-panelist with uh, James. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to talk to you about the importance of small creatures in this uh, often neglected world of nature photography. Uh, it's not only about lions and tigers in the world because of course they are the flagship species, but more importantly, it's the small insects which made up, make up the large proportion of the animal kingdom in the world. So, so there's a huge opportunity available for all the budding scientists or photographers uh, to shoot the small, you know, shoot in the sense photograph, I mean, not uh, literally shoot, uh, photograph them in their natural surroundings. There's a huge opportunity. So I feel not much has been done in this regard. Um, so I took up as a cause to uh, concentrate on these small critters. Um, and in that small critters is a beautiful section called the Lepidoptera family, which consists of the moths and the butterflies. And uh, as a youngster, as a kid, uh, these butterflies always you know, had a special uh, interest in me. The, the beautiful colors that they exhibit, uh, the, the way they fly around, very gentle. And uh, you will never see a butterfly being a harmful creature, right? It's always uh, known as the most blissful creatures among insects. So that what got me attracted towards butterflies. And, uh, and there has been no looking back since. And uh, I'm very glad that I could uh, cover about 700 species of the 1,350 odd species that are found in the Indian geographical area. So uh, I'm very fortunate. Uh, and uh, I, I really want to cross the thousand mark and I'm sure I will get there pretty soon. And uh, this exhibition has uh, you know, uh, given me the opportunity to connect with so many fellow photographers from all around the world. And uh, um, that's the best part of being on the panel. I mean, you can interact with so many great photographers who are in this panel uh, all over the world and uh, you know, collaborating with them, talking with them, you know, uh, understanding their photographs is itself a great learning that I take back as a panelist. And uh, uh, just to give you a few facts about uh, butterflies, uh, uh, there are about 16,000 to 18,000 uh, recorded species of butterflies in the world. Uh, majority of them are in the neotropical region of uh, the Americas. Um, and a lot of them from Africa, and uh, the Indian Asian part. Um, so they uh, prefer a tropical climate, though some butterflies uh, you know, uh, enjoy cooler climates, but mostly, more generally speaking, butterflies are concentrated in the tropics, the tropical zone, between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. Uh, they like humidity, they like uh, less harsh climate conditions and uh, they just enjoy you know being in that perfect ideal conditions so butterflies are in another sense biological indicators what do you mean by indicator so in other sense if a forest or a piece of land is doing well so we don't have to go check out the soil check out the air check out the uh, trees or plants you just look at the amount of butterfly species which are just flying around and you automatically know that that particular 
geographical location or area is doing fantastically well just by looking at those beautiful butterflies flying around. So that is why I call it as a biological indicator. And uh, the other part about uh, the butterflies is the four stages of its metamorphosis. And it's still amazing to know that how a particular caterpillar, which goes into a pupil stage, comes out to be something which nobody can fathom into a fantastic, beautiful, brilliant uh, butterfly. I mean, it's, it's even today, scientists are still trying to find out how this caterpillar undergoes this metamorphosis to become a beautiful butterfly. Uh, it is still a mystery. It is still uh, under a lot of uh, research, but that's the beauty of nature, you know? And it's all about this, how people, uh, it gives us a very important uh, lesson that, uh, you know, uh, it, life is all about change. Life is all about growing. And how uh, a seemingly not so brilliant looking caterpillar can undergo a wonderful transformation and become a butterfly. That's, that's one of the learnings that you can have from these butterflies. Okay? So it has a lot of aesthetic value. It has a lot of uh, you know, joyful uh, pleasure that you can see when a butterfly flies around. And that's what's attracted me to this species. And uh, it's just uh, magical when a butterfly flies or flutters, as they say. Um, and uh, I've been enjoying clicking butterflies from the last uh, seven, eight years now. So it's been a fantastic journey so far. Um, and I really want to you know, be amongst nature. And who doesn't like to be in pristine environment, in the forest, clean water, clean weather? Okay, uh, it's uh, you know, a fantastic uh, feeling just to be in nature. And, how, and I want to share to the world that uh, Keeping a clean environment is, you know, very important. So it allows us to coexist with nature. And uh, these, uh, this is what we teach here in our college about, uh, you know, having um, given the importance of nature. Sadly, not much awareness is there in today's generation where they are glued to, you know, their electronic gadgets. But when our students have been exposed to nature on our nature club trips, they absolutely you know, think that, okay, there is another parallel universe which is there okay, in, in this world. It's, uh, they simply get awestruck and uh, some of them, and we're really happy that we have inspired a few students to you know, uh, make change in their lifestyle and become more aware in their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, things and how they, their mundane things how a small effort of theirs can make a, a huge impact okay, in bringing some quality uh, change in this world. And that is the need of that. As uh, uh, Mr. Ricky uh, Cage has already mentioned wonderfully, and he has portrayed it through his work, the importance of conserving and protecting uh, nature. Uh, he's done a wonderful job at it. I, I thank you, Ricky, for doing that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and uh, that's the whole idea of this uh, festival. It's all about celebrating our mother earth, right? Uh, we need to give her that much of importance, that much of value, you know, so we can really make a difference and bring about that change in the hearts through an emotional connect rather than, you know, just talking or telling them about it. Uh, it, the best way is to really, you know, experience nature in its pristine glory. And, and we've been trying to do that uh, to a certain extent at BNMIT. And um, uh, thank you, Madam. I, I wouldn't want to take much time here. Uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, Bangalore, uh, our city here in South India, is a fantastic place for butterflies, uh, just to add that. We have about uh, 175 recorded species in Bangalore. And uh, uh, in our college, we are fortunate to have about 130 species recorded. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing and we've been trying to do this. And wherever we go, uh, we've been, uh, I've been advocating to have some uh, butterfly attracting plants. Okay? Um, butterflies require only two plants. One is for their caterpillars to feed on. And one is once they become an adult, 
uh, the nectar to feed off their uh, on the juices right of the uh, nectaring plants so if you can add these two plants you can attract at least 20 to 30 butterflies in your own houses on a terrace garden and it's not difficult to do so uh, maybe in the question and answer round following this i will take up a few questions and uh, try to show you how to attract at least 25 butterflies to your gardens or to your houses okay with a few plants okay not much about 10 plants i can share with you and you can also enjoy this wonderful insect called the butterfly in your in your houses okay so with that i would like to thank uh, the panelists uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my few things and i would uh, encourage everybody to go through the uh, curated exhibitions with uh, uh, mr james and myself uh, we, have, we have tried our best uh, to bring the best artists from all around uh, the world and to give you a glimpse of the wonderful nature that we have today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ishwa. Um, that was very, very inspiring to hear your energy and enthusiasm that you have for butterflies. And I think what everybody on this call who goes into the exhibition will see uh, very shortly is what a talented photographer you are at capturing them, how very, very beautiful and varied they are. And also, I think, um, experience just, I guess what we were trying to do in the exhibition, which was come from, as you said at the very beginning, from small, from the micro species, the species that are often forgotten through to the macro, which uh, many of us spend an awful lot of our time uh, photographing. And I hope that everybody that comes into the exhibition with us and subsequently will will feel that and, and see that variety, that beautiful diversity of species that we're lucky enough to have around us. You also mentioned 100 and I think 70 something species of butterfly recorded in Bengaluru. Bengaluru is famous, of course, not just for butterfly diversity, but also for diversity in photographers. And with our panel here, uh, we have myself and yourself, uh, but we have two more Bengalurians uh, to talk to us and, uh, this evening. And first up, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Hayat Mohammed. Hayat, like Ishwa, is a fantastic photographer in terms of uh, small invertebrate species, things that are often overlooked. And I hope that everybody that views his work will be as excited as I am by it. He is an IT professional who, who takes to nature to keep his sanity in check. Born and raised here in Bangalore, he enjoys finding open areas during the development of the city Sorry, his ability to find open areas during the development of the city fueled his interest towards insects and butterflies. He now uses macro photography as a means of exploring them and showcasing the many wonders of the arthropod world to humans. Hayath, over to you. Thank you, James, and thank you, team, for the opportunity. And I think uh, that sums up well. Like Ricky mentioned, I've always been, uh, growing up, I always used to think, Am I a little different than the others? Am I a little bit, a little bit of a little bit, a little weird? Because I think, but uh, with the onset of uh, social media, and uh, that's when I actually understood that I am actually not that unique. <laughs> there are other weirdos like me, right? But that that also fueled a lot of interest into asking the right questions, right? Seeing uh, the so we, growing up in Bangalore, we used to have these uh, thing called Parthenium that would overtake most of the open areas. And there would be one particular beetle, right? I used to call it a beetle at that time, but now I know it's a kind of a ladybird, right? So that used to, that is effective in controlling that. So that's how uh, I developed this whole interest of finding out what do caterpillars eat, trying to rear the um, caterpillars into pupas, and then watching them emerge. So the, that's been the... Um, what do you say, the vocational vacation time pass that I used to do, right? And I, growing up with the onset of uh, social media and uh, a lot of information available freely, uh, it really did fuel my uh, interest towards the arthropod kingdom. So I, in, in, with this, I'll probably just try to go ahead and very quickly uh, give a glimpse into this amazing world. Uh, just let me know once you're able to see the screen uh, that I have on. We can see your screen. All right, perfect. All right, 
So with this, the first question, right? So why study or observe arthropods? So these actually form, if you uh, see the uh, pyramid of organism itself, so these form the major part of uh, the slices or slabs, if you will, of the pyramid of uh, creatures on Earth, right? So first and foremost, they are more readily available all around you. And also, like Ishwar did mention, uh, give a, a good insight into the biodiversity and the balance of the system itself, right? So often you will find people saying, hey, I visit uh, sanctuaries which are far off, and I also go ahead and uh, uh, go to uh, bird sanctuaries which are far, far off, right? But a lot of it can be seen right in your garden, which could be as small as a few pots in your balcony, right? So that's one of the things which will, I hope, uh, fuel this. And I, my, one of the reasons I've taken to photography is to also go ahead and showcase the kind of beauty that exists all around us and which is often I call hidden in plain sight, right? So some of the beauty that we see around is uh, with the geometry and structure. So this often is, it gives us a lot of inspiration, right? So st stuff such as the beauty of how perfect, uh, uh, interestingly called geometry day, which is almost like half and half perfect symmetry. And on the right, you can see uh, a Gelicky Day moth and the shield bug, which forms a perfect uh, mask from almost like uh, the region of Masai Mara, if you could. Right? Uh, here's a rolled up millipede with the also uh, perfect Fibonacci, right? If you would if you'd like to go ahead and watch that. And here's a, a bunch of eggs which have just hatched. So these are of the shield bugs. So this, you, this, all of this enables a lot of uh, structure and colors which are often missed, right? And if I could probably just put this to scale, the whole uh, uh, egg structure was probably less than half an inch. And then that you fit in tons of it, right? So uh, when you actually st start studying behavior, right? So you actually begin to understand how the whole system works. Right? When you go from the micro to the macro, like James uh, just did go ahead and mention, when we talk of an ecosystem or a habitat, what do we think of? We say, okay, it's a marshy swampland, it's a grassland, right? Then you go ahead and start seeing smaller, a bunch of trees, a small garden in your house, and then one single plant on which probably the whole life cycle of a species uh, depends on, right? So once you start understanding all of that, your perspective on how you see things will is bound to de definitely change, right? So here's uh, a false day or a, a daddy long legs with the parental care. We think uh, humans uh, are good at it, but then there are some shining examples from this hidden world as well. We think teamwork, bonding together, well, they do it better than us, right? Mimicking, right? So it's often something which uh, humans do try to be something they're not, but here is a ant mimic spider. And a paper wasp. And you going with macro photography details, you actually then understand how everything works, right? And you start asking questions, like such as, why do you think a mandible is in such a particular position? It helps in biting down and uh, processing fibers a lot more easier for it to go ahead and build a, what we call as a paper, a paper nest. So the structures of the compound eyes, the uh, molting process, which allows these arthropods to have a very hard exoskeleton on its out, protecting it. But because of that, they, as they keep growing, they also need to keep shedding or under, undergo this process called molting. And we've always seen caterpillars have great grip. How do they do it? Again, the answer is right here. So in terms of having these little legs called prolegs. So we think we are great farmers across civilizations, but guess what? Ants just go ahead and do this with the same manner with a lot of uh, honeydew secreting insects and nymphal forms. And there's a particular wasp which goes ahead and chooses a host as small as a, uh, probably a few mm across and you can actually see the uh, larva of the wasp 
as an ectoparasite on the wasp itself. And here you see the, without a lack of an ambulance, the weaver ants carry some of the injured back. Right, and then you go ahead with various life stages which form, make it very, very interesting. So you see uh, eggs, which are perfect in geometry, something which would walk right past probably nine, nine times out of 10. Right, and then you see uh, cylindrical structures, you see nymphal forms, you see uh, the caterpillar forms, which look nothing like how the adult is going to look like. Colors which change based on how often, uh, how recently they've uh, shed. Parental care with the uh, thing we just saw, the uh, daddy long legs. So in this case, uh, the mother actually carries the whole sack full of eggs and doesn't eat for the whole, pro uh, for the whole time that she's carrying this egg sack. And like we mentioned, uh, the whole process of, of going through the various stages. So on the left is a cicada. So hard to believe that the whole uh, length of this was crammed into as small as a shell as that. And on the right side, you see the two-tailed spider molting, which uses gravity to go ahead and exit out of its old shell. Right, and obviously uh, people say eek, but I don't say eek, there's a lot of bizarreness. So here's a almost translucent, uh, tortoise shell beetle and when I actually saw this and I was like is this a gynodomorph but it wasn't so it apparently is just a, a it has damaged elytra due to which the coloration is goes right so so some of the questions by training I'm actually an engineer right but what it, this has also let me is has kept the little kid in me alive and I think that Staying a kid is very important in asking dumb questions. Often you lead, the dumb questions will lead to a lot of discovery. Right, so here's a bunch of owlfly larvae which have just hatched out of the egg. A very bizarre looking lobster moth caterpillar. This blends in as flat as it can get. So here, what if I would say, I just spoke about uh, ecosystem and dependencies, right? So this, if I would say, this wasp relies solely on this one particular grasshopper called the gaudy, gaudy grasshopper, spends the most of its life as an ectoparasite on top of it, lays eggs on top of it, the larval stage finishes, and then they had, ha, uh, hitch a right back on it. So for them, the environment habitat is just one single insect. It's not a full grown uh, grassland, not a forest, it's all this. And then you start multiplying this in terms of dependencies and other things, the fascination is just never ending. First look probably might say, hey, you know what, just a bird dung thing, but this is actually a caterpillar, uh, sorry, a bird dung mimicking a spider. You can actually see the eyes and legs. Right. Uh, so again, a very uh, cool looking uh, vinegaroon. They also call whip scorpions. Right. And uh, with this, also what we go ahead and start understanding is you start making mental notes of where you find what. Right. So you start understanding where do you go ahead and find uh, to look or find them again. So this is a species of moth. Uh, probably this, I think, is if not the first, at least the first couple of records from India. Got lucky, this was right outside uh, the room of a cottage which stayed in and cooled. A paper wasp against the sunset. So here's the, uh, so hard to believe all of the structure is just from uh, plant matter that they convert into all, almost mulch back into a, a, a paper-like structure. So beetles, um, I'll probably just skip through. How are we doing on time? I think I should be pretty close. So I'll I probably... just discreetly sent you an instant message saying sure. we ought to wrap soon, my friend. All right, all right. Uh, so I'll just get through and say, all right. Um, and I'll just probably take a couple of uh, slides more where uh, we might just think, hey, uh, insects are so prolific, they'll just take over the world. But you know what? There is a fine balance in the whole thing. So here uh, you have 
like wasps, they are, I think, the single most controller, so to speak, of species. They have, there's, for every type of egg there is, I certainly believe there's a, a definite kind of a wasp, which ensures that eggs and caterpillars don't, uh, larval forms don't get out of control. All right, with, with that, I really thank you for the opportunity. I, I hope I did not bug you, so to speak, but makes me feel a little less weird. <laughs> thank you. Hi, thank you on behalf of everybody. That, that's a fascinating uh, set of photographs. Thank Your you. energy and enthusiasm again comes through and I was loath to, uh, to encourage you to stop. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the unfortunate things about being chair that sometimes you have to be mean in order to be kind and make sure people not. that have dialed in uh, have an opportunity to ask us questions uh, before the end. But thank you, Hayath, definitely not in the least thank bit you weird. Okay, so the next person that's going to talk to us and present this evening is uh, Sri Jayant Sharma. Uh, Jayant is the co-founder and CEO of Toehold. Now, when I was preparing to move to India, uh, one of the things that you do when you're going on a posting, if you're a naturalist, environmentalist, photographer, enthusiast, is try and find out who's there and what's there and where you might go. And Jayant's name and Toehold's name was probably right at the top of the, uh, of the Google search that I performed back in uh, early 2017. Uh, I've only recently met him, but it's been a pleasure to get to know him, and I'm delighted that he's talking to us this evening. Giants took up serious photography in 2004. He co-founded Toehold in 2010, and since then has been a prolific producer of stunning imagery, the kind that is planned in a studio and executed outdoors. He wants to explore all possible natural hotspots of the world whilst he's on the planet. His unique expertise in photography in a truly eclectic range of wilderness areas, from Southeast Asia to Canada, Brazil to Norway, East Africa to Eastern Russia, is supplemented by his immense experience in the Indian subcontinent, which I can personally attest to. Having worked in the mighty Himalayas, the unexplored Northeast, the secretive South, and the tiger havens of central India, Giant is yet another Bengalurian, a homegrown photographer gone totally global. Giant, over to you. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to uh, all of you from wherever you're joining us. So I, I'll keep it um, within my slot of 10 minutes. Thank you very much. So what I want to share in these 10 minutes is um, my affair with nature and wildlife and my journey as a photographer. I want to give you a little bit of a brief on how I became a wildlife photographer. Um, I won't take too much time. I was a techie working in multinational companies. Uh, the last I remember was being a user experience designer in the America Online and Accentures of the world. Um, I uh, would probably share a quick presentation to make it a little more interesting than uh, showing you just my face. So I hope you can see that. Uh, James, can, can you see my slide? I can see. Okay, great. So uh, I, I'm calling this, we conserve what we love. The idea of what I feel is um, as photographers, um, I, I do highly appreciate the perspective of, you know, uh, having the responsibility to produce stories of lesser known animals and species like, you know, the spiders and insects and all of those. But I'll tell you from where I come from. So I was actually born in a family where photography was business. My dad is a photographer. We ran a commercial studio. So it was very easy for me to get into the world of photography. But I never wanted to become a photographer until I realized why I should. So I was not one of those guys who picked up a camera and decided, hey, now that I have a camera, what do I photograph? I never associated the camera with, um, you know, uh, just clicking until I realized my passion for nature and wildlife in my late teenage years and early 20s. And I started um, traveling to uh, places around Mysore where I come from. And I started uh, traveling from Bangalore once I moved here. So this is a picture of monitor lizards that I photographed. One of my first few pictures that went on the cover of a magazine called Sanctuary Asia. Over the years, I feel I've spent a lot of time mastering, um, you know, especially instructional abilities as a wildlife photographer. I do a lot of workshops and I teach people. So I have mastered how to teach photography very well. Um, so just for records, I run this company where we have probably introduced over 10,000 people to the world of photography. And I suspect more than three fourths of them would be nature photographers because the, the instructors are nature photographers. So it's very uh, obvious that they'll start falling in love with nature and wildlife. 
So what I feel is um, the reason why I became a wildlife photographer is not really honestly about conservation or anything big like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who was in my mid twenties. And for me, it was just about being in awe of nature and being appreciative of these animals and flowers and landscapes and all of that, that we could appreciate. So it was more of a personal reason that I wanted to go around. I spent a lot of my personal money initially to travel around the globe. And I've had the fortune of being on most of the continents, except Australia. I don't know why I haven't been there yet, but I realize when I start taking workshops, when I start talking to people, when I start educating them about nature and wildlife, very soon I realized I wouldn't be able to achieve greater success. When I say success, I don't mean a personal success as being a successful photographer, but I mean the larger goal of why we all do photography, right? So apart from the fact that I want to see all the animals in this world before I leave this planet, as James said, I also feel if I want many more people to become nature's ambassadors, I would probably want to start with the megafauna or for that matter, the flagship species as uh, professor called it. Um, and that's probably an easier way for me to make f uh, people fall in love with nature. Like for example, the elephants, the polar bears, the tigers, the lions, the cheetahs, jaguars of the world are what I use uh, to probably communicate stories. But I also use the mechanism of making pretty pictures. I don't really do too much of wildlife documentary photography. Um, I use a lot of picture um, presentations where the photographs are visually attractive. And that's what I feel is one of the easiest way for us to get uh, the common man intrigued and start falling in love with nature. So this is just a brief um, you know, um, map of what I have uh, you know, th these are the places that I have worked in at least a couple of times, if not more. So I have had a holistic perspective of this globe. Um, and I feel um, a lot of times when I share pictures of polar bears, or let's say I share pictures of pumas or all that to the Indian context, which is what my 90% uh, of my audience is, they all start telling me, why do you need to go to the polar bears or the pumas or let's say, you know, the jaguars of the world. There are so much there's so much wildlife in India and there's so much of problems in India itself. So I uh, feel it's very important for somebody like me to be able to bridge the gap between a scientist and a common man. That's the unique position we photographers are in. Because if you understand, if you walk into NCBS, for example, in Bangalore, the Center for uh, Bio, uh, you know, Biological Sciences, uh, they know quite a lot about the wildlife, nature, world, environment, and everything like that. But then I feel it's people like us who are photographers who have this unique pole position to bridge the gap between passing on the scientific knowledge, which is perhaps sitting in white papers and, you know, let's say PhD theses and stuff like that, or let's say scientific journals and not reaching the common man's house, which is where I feel people like me have a great opportunity. And that's why I use my photography skills of making pretty pictures, attractive pictures, sometimes dramatic pictures, pictures which make the common man uh, be in awe of nature and start wondering now, 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 if I, if I show this picture to any common man who has not been to the wilderness or seen uh, tigers in the wild might really think these two tigers have a problem with each other and they're fighting and they'll kill themselves in a few minutes. But then that's when they realize this is a very common sight when there's a mating pair and just when the mating happens and just immediately after that, there'll be a small, you know, tiff. I, I still don't have an explanation to give to small children about why they fight like this. But the point I'm trying to make is without showing beautiful pictures, it will be very difficult for us to gather momentum of this larger audience to fall in love with nature because I seriously feel if they don't love something, they won't even listen to you and no point in talking to them about conservation, about protection, about plastic, about this and that without really making them fall in love with these kind of things. So that is the whole point of what I bring to the table. While business is business, I look at business from a business perspective and I want to do the best for my clients who pay for their experience and pay for my time and stuff like that. I feel there's very, very good possibility of me, um, you know, having this undercurrent agenda of being um, a, an environment friendly, wildlife friendly, wildlife photographer, because, you know, um, I keep saying on my social media all the time that if we cannot use these pretty pictures to um, help strike conversations about conservation, then these are the most useless pictures. So they might be the sharpest pictures, but they might be the most useless pictures that we have ever produced. 
So um, that's uh, pretty much the way I think. Um, I uh, use these kind of pictures and make fine art prints because I think it's not just enough to be on social media because I have this very, very good analysis of who watches my pictures. 90% of people on my Instagram are people who want to make such pictures themselves and they are not my target apart from the business. I think if you want the common man to see um, these kind of amazing pictures, it has to be away from social media because the common man, your uncle, aunt, is not on Instagram and they're not tagging or they're not following a hashtag called tigers or jaguars and stuff like that. It has to be on the walls of houses, which is where I strive hard to make fine art prints and see if more people get into fine art printing because if these don't go on the walls, they are probably not going to be decorated as really admired animals which need to be protected. So these are some of the animals. This is a jaguar in the Pantanal. I'm skipping through these slides because there's a very short time I have. I, I can't speak specifically about photographs. I just wanted to give a gist of what I do as a photographer. Uh, one of my recent expeditions to the Pant I mean, the Patagonia region. This is a place called Torres del Paine, a mountain lion in front of the famous Towers of Paine. And uh, of course, one of my favorite places in the globe is the Arctic, Svalbard precisely. Um, Michelle, I've also been to Canada, a lot of work around... Uh, uh, Churchill, Manitoba, um, I have, uh, but I enjoy going to Svalbard because of the pristine beauty here, the landscape here, uh, the ex exotic species that lives here. I feel there's a very easy inference that we can make between the Arctic and a tropic. And for example, somebody sitting in Mumbai and Bangalore should learn about the Arctic without wasting any time because we will get affected if the Arctic is getting affected. And that's one of my um, you know, undercurrent agendas or what I do as a wildlife photographer. So these are some Beautiful images. I'm sure I've shared some with the exhibition. Whoever is going to watch that will also be able to uh, see a lot of these images. And I would be happy to answer any questions if you guys have. Uh, this is me in uh, the far east of Russia. It's a place called Kamchatka. And if you guys want to know anything about photography and all the places I've been to, I'll be very happy to share any information that you need. Last point, I think just like insects and um, these kind of animals, there's a huge scope for today's photographers to take up uh, a specific area in which they can do wildlife and let's say photography, which is of course underwater photography. I feel it's still not done enough, especially in waters like Indian waters, like Andaman Nicobar, which is like a gold mine of wildlife. I think a lot of people should also delve into these kind of areas to bring back stories and pictures of the underwater world, which I think is quite literally an area for you to excel and stand out from 25 different people who have tiger images. That is pretty much my show, James. Thank you very much for the time. And I think I have just enough stuck to the time. Thank you, Giant. Thank you very much indeed. So we've gone from macro, invertebrates, butterflies, all the way to bouncing far away from India and uh, a visual feast as we traveled around the world. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Giant. So, uh, Ishwar and I really hoped that in putting together the exhibition, we would do exactly that, that we would have Indian wildlife and the things that were close to home for those of us that, that live here. And then we would have international wildlife and pictures to inspire people to think about places that they might want to go or areas that might need protection uh, that are further, further afield. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And hopefully you will see that very soon when we do the virtual tour. But we're halfway through this panel session now. Uh, we've got three more speakers. We've got 45 minutes. So I'm gonna ask each of them to do their very, very best to keep to the 10 minute limit so that we do have uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions at the end from, from those of you who are online. Next up is Srimat Ratika Ramasamy. She was born in a village, which I should have read the name of this before and tried to practice it, Venkata Chalapuram, near Taini in a town in South India. Ratika has always had a fierce connect with the drama of nature. She's passionate about birds and specializes in bird photography. In documenting birds through her photographs, she has developed a style of technical excellence combined with a captivating story. She has traveled to most of India's national parks and national parks in Africa to document indigenous species as well as wildlife. Her work has been appreciated and featured in several national and international publications as well as exhibitions. She regularly conducts wildlife photography workshops and holds talks all over India. Without further ado, Ratika, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me for this lovely uh, panel discussion. 
it's uh, really interesting to see my friends mr jain sir and other panelists talk also and i would like to wish everyone happy wildlife week greetings to everyone uh small introduction of my, my myself just a second i'll go on speaker yeah i as a, i am also taking a computer engineering mba doing in the corporate world and for a sudden i fell in love you can say my first visit to barakpur bird sanctuary really changed my life though photography is a hobby for from since childhood when tenth standard i am doing photography but uh, my first visit to barakpur bird sanctuary i really fascinated by birds colorful birds and i want to capture them to <clears throat> see after some time and uh, started like this it has been 17 years and i love to shoot indian forest Though I have been to other African countries, South African country, I love to showcase Indian fauna and flora. And not only documentation purpose, my photography, I love to capture the emotions and interaction, behavioral interaction. I do have lot of portfolio of images, but today I am not going to show that type of uh, uh, photograph. Today, my uh, I will keep it a short and simple. Uh, for recently, for few years. Uh, i am into along with my regular photography commercial photography i am into little bit of conservation also that is it's time to give you pay be wise for the wiseless photography with a purpose uh, for me uh, with uh, even uh, india and bangalore we have lot of nature photographers who is beautiful photographer of course as my friends uh, they and said to <coughs> create awareness to uh, draw attention to the wildlife we need beautiful photographs but at the same time uh, it is time to give way even like uh, uh, all the top photographers and all upcoming photographer also it's time to look beyond beauty okay we need more conservation uh, photographs we need more story telling photographs i would like to show you few photographs from my uh, <coughs> collection let me show so it looks like uh, documentation but in india we have lot of endangered and uh, uh, animals also and uh, birds also most of the time even vultures are now with the uh, numbers are very less so vultures population has become very less one of the nilagiri tar is also one of the endangered uh, uh, antelope in south india eravikulam national park this is also one of the primitive lion tail macaw It was eating, uh, what do you say, jack fruit. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it's again dangerous. Also, the numbers are very less. This is one of the lesser floricon. I took it in our hard meat. They are also again dangerous, uh, but uh, but numbers are very less. Uh, unless we don't answer, we want them uh, see maybe the next generation. Numbers are also very less. Mm -hmm. Of course, one hand dinosaur is also father. Uh, i think uh, one of next to tiger we can say next to tiger most sporting animals we can say but successfully the rhino conservation is successful but still uh, we need more uh, people to work on conserve this uh, species so my visit to kaziranga i try to capture few photograph of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, one more dinosaur the next uh, thing is so this is the dasai wetland uh, usually dadri wetland in haryana as of course i can use a beautiful photograph are screen and all but few photographs the wetlands are now uh, the habitat loss i can see everywhere the habitat loss these are the original wetlands now because of uh, maybe the agri farm farmers and all they sold the places so we can see the building okay it's not a beautiful background we, for the photographic purpose it's not a beautiful background you can see the building you can see okay grey leg goose are flying and this is one of my recent visit to sambal bird sanctuary kimas are one of the endangered bird species they do breed in uh, fresh water river only you can see only two places i can say orissa pascosa uh, tiger is there and sambal bird sanctuary so uh, usually when we say conservation means ugly photograph not like that like we get to see the beautiful photograph i do get a chance to do green ganga campaign when initially when i started photography so that gave me purpose story telling images that we have to emphasize uh, 
see the uh, so the place also the importance of the place also beautiful side also and ugly side also so you can see the beautiful uh, skimmer they do uh, have the breeding action so you can see the next uh, is very alarming picture this is not a very beautiful photograph but as a conservation point of view you can see the uh, illegal sand mining national sample sensory sensory is as a, a national uh, uh, 1972 to forest act we can't take anything from any national reserve it's a, it's a illegal act you will be punished but this is a highway you can see skimmers are there and magadis also crocodiles also sand are seen and the people are illegal mining is also going on so i documented this photograph of course i said a certain person also even some sample birds and other ducks also will come all the birds pool birds and the ducks and uh, other forms also here especially you find and red crested pottard also so you can see the sand mining okay so for me yeah i will know. i will stop uh, the screen share so upcoming photographers uh, most of the time uh, as they said of course elephants tigers are uh, uh, yeah, important but we do say more unexposed species more species need our attention so in upcoming photographers even uh, top photographers all of my research to uh, please photograph them also and uh, try to be, uh, do this bit of along with your regular work be to do some conservation uh, photography some story selling images of course it may be sometimes uh, we usually say photograph is a powerful tool one photograph can speak a thousand ways so any campaign recently for example i would like to say one example recently some um, uh, conservation is you some pro- problem in vedanangal bird sanctuary so everyone is uh, asking vedanangal photograph so luckily i had some photographs that photograph used for the campaign purpose so in so simply telling vedanangal bird sanctuary but people see the photograph oh these type of birds are coming vedanangal we get to picture so more people are uh, actually participated this is a small example and uh, people who students who are watching this program there is no need to have high end camera high end lenses your mobile phone itself you can uh, use for this purpose so look around yourself if anything come with uh, habitat loss any species loss no just document and you can say nowadays we get social media and uh, who knows it will create really great uh, impact and i would like to tell only one instance in madras uh, crocodile uh, in 19 i think 70 uh, miss j vidya she took her point and shoot camera okay with all these with the uh, tassel and all of they just they like a business they usually mascara they just uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, market and all of they just sell he took a uh, photograph not a very great photograph and uh, i think miss uh, paper and bubbles and mr miss uh, indra gandhi uh, our uh, ex uh, framing test saw the photographs and he suddenly uh, get a act acted and stop the um, uh, all the illegal activity so small photograph simple photograph can make it great so upcoming photographer or even nature lover you not be a photographer of course people who are doing uh, beautiful story beautiful uh, photographs also along with the regular photograph give some time for the uh, conservation photography also photography for the purpose story selling images are very much needed and it's very <laughs> these days as a wildlife week and it nowadays is very important also we can do it okay and i will end my talk here uh, because of the time duration any questions i will be ready to answer questions thank you for giving me the opportunity to put my views thank you ratika and thank you for mentioning yeah. politics in your presentation um obviously next year uh, 2021 has two huge international political meetings the uh, cop26 the climate conference is going to be in the uk in uh, november december of 2021 and also china is hosting the biodiversity conference of parties to uh look at what we what more we can do to ensure conservation of species so next year is going to be hugely hugely important uh for the political uh, sphere around around environment and nature i also wanted as i say thank you to you to say how delighted i am that we've managed to get two female speakers 
on this panel. When I was asked okay. if I would, uh, when I was asked if I would take this role as chair, I said that the UK has now uh, stated that we want to try on all panels to get pro full equivalents. Um, it hasn't been possible today. We haven't got three and three, but two is very definitely uh, progress in the right direction. So yeah. thank you, Radhika, for being a part of that. Uh, and Thanks. on that basis, I'm now going to hand over to Michelle. So Michelle Valberg has photographed uh, wildlife and landscapes with the intention of regenerating simple beauty into a deeper reflection of humanity. Her work portrays the natural world and aims to draw viewers towards inner contemplation based on the idea that building awareness and educating others through nature photography can inspire people to be better stewards, exactly the themes that we've just been talking about. Not only is she an icon ambassador, but she's the first Canadian geographic photographer in residence. She's a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society and the prestigious Explorers Club in New York City. She has published four books. It's a pleasure and an honor to have Michelle with us today. I'm delighted to invite her to speak to us now. Thank you so much, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we, I am in Ottawa, Canada, far up uh, in the, in the um, world of North America, <laughs> where the leaves are changing and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful time of year. So thank you very much for, for having me. And uh, I'm honored to, to be on a panel with such esteemed, wonderful photographers. And it is amazing always to see what is in this beautiful world and what we have to learn and uh, from those tiny tiny little creatures to the to the bigger creatures um, I'm always inspired and and just wanting to share my work in so many ways so thank you again I'll just share my screen here and I always hope that it'll work is that good Good. Awesome. Well, of course, I had to start with polar bears. <laughs> uh, I've been a photographer for over 30 years, and uh, you might say I'm, I'm, I'm madly obsessed with photography. I've been lucky to be a photographer for uh, as long as I have and to live my dream as, as a professional. And, uh, you know, when I started out at such a young age, because, you know, I, I clearly it was really young since I've been a photographer for over 30 years, um, I, uh, you know, I wanted to make a living at photography. And as much as my passion was nature and wildlife, I knew I had to make a living at photography. So I did what I had to do. I did pretty much anything I, I could in photography and video production, actually. Uh, so I photographed the weddings and the events and portraits and I still do portraits and uh, I'm, I'm a lover of all wild things and obviously my focus over the last number of years um, based on what I've been producing has been in the wild and I feel fortunate every single time that I'm out in the field and being able to to photograph these amazing creatures with the intention of showing the world um, what we have to lose if we don't take better care of our planet and the learning and the education, like I've done this morning and listening to all of you speak about these amazing creatures um, that we, we share and, uh, this planet with. And, you know, we're borrowing it from our, our children and this planet. And it is so important for all of us to be aware of what we have to lose. And um, I admire all of you and everybody who is out there photographing uh, the wild kingdom and nature in, a, in all its glory. Um, my world outside of the photography um, that I did for, to make a living like weddings and, and portraits and that sort of thing. I found myself on the top of Baffin Island in Canada, photographing polar bears and literally it changed my world. And it became an obsession to know that I had to bring the north to the south and show what it is that we have up in, in Canada's north. And as much as I have traveled to other parts of the world and uh, I've been on every continent, I am obsessed really with our own, our own world in Canada. And, and with uh, the pandemic, because I was to be in Africa and Greenland and Iceland and Norway and um, the Northwest Passage as well, um, I have discovered way more of my own backyard. And as much as 
I do work in, in my, my own backyard. In this last little while, it's been amazing to see um, creatures and, and have experiences that I had never had before um, because I had been traveling to, to other places. So it's been a blessing in that way that I've been at home and, and, uh, and I'm sure for all of you. And by the way, India is definitely, if somebody says, where, do, where haven't you been and where would you like to go? India is on the top of my list, especially for the tiger. So uh, I'm uh, loving all of, your, all of your images. Okay, so I'm not sure why I can't move forward with my presentation. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know why I don't have my photos up. Let's see. All right. James, are you there? I'm here and we've gone to a white screen, Michelle. Yeah. So I can see your cursor, but I can't see any image. Oh. And what about there? Sorry, everyone. No, I think we've now lost screen sharing altogether. But... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe because I didn't press forward. Hey, now we're back. It's funny that you're just getting blank screen. Yeah, so I can see this. See on the left, I can see where we're trying to go. Play from start. Oh, isn't that weird? It was there. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, probably you could try restarting PowerPoint itself. So just a technical glitch. Yeah, it's interesting because it, can you see my PowerPoint? We can, we can see your PowerPoint and we can see the, the reel of photos on the left-hand edge. So I can see, okay. see the so, loom and the fox. <laughs> okay, now what? <laughs> They're all gone. I hate when this happens. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Michelle, do you want to, would, would the solution be that I invite, introduce Ben and invite Ben to speak now and give you five minutes to see if you can fix things? That would be really awesome. My Brilliant. apologies. Not at all. In which case, uh, I'm going to skip straight past and straight on to Ben, who was going to be our last photographer, but we will loop back to Michelle afterwards. So Ben Hall is uh, a Brit, which I'm delighted about because working in the British Deputy High Commission, it would be unfortunate if I didn't have a British colleague to show some of the talent uh, that exists in the UK in wildlife photography. Ben has gained world, worldwide recognition as one of Britain's leading professional wildlife photographers. His images are often surprising, always striking, and he is always striving to awaken people to the diversity of the natural world, a common theme amongst all of us, I think. He is described by Living Edge magazine as a passionate and experienced wildlife photographer with a perfectionist eye for detail. He has a lifelong passion for the natural world and has used his skill in photography to capture many stunning images. He is driven by the need to protect and preserve Britain's last fragile ecosystems, as testified by his work for the RSPB in the UK, Wildlife Trusts, which administer different pockets of natural beauty in the UK and other conservation organisations. Ben is an inspiration to me personally, and I'm absolutely delighted that he's able to join us today. Ben, over to you. Thank you, James. Um, do you want, are you able to share my images on the screen? If Varsha's on standby, Varsha can share. So I have them on um, Adobe Bridge, but when I try and screen share, it opens it up full screen, so I can't go back then to pick that exact screen. Um, uh, ben, do you want us to share screen for you? Uh, yes, please. All right, uh, Koti ji, can you please share screen? Can you share the folder that says Ben, please? Yeah, one moment. Yeah. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so when I want to skip, I'll just say next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I'll just start by giving you a little bit of brief background about myself. Um, I studied photography, started quite early when I was still at school. Um, I always had a real love for the natural world, um, passion for the outdoors. Um, so when my interest in photography started, it was seemed the logical thing to do to combine the two two passions um, and I, after school I went on to study documentary and fine art photography at college um, and that's when so that's when I started to realize that you know I want to go into this as a profession um, and at first I didn't know how to go about this when I left college I, I got a job full-time job actually for an insurance company whilst I did the photography on the side so I was going out as much as I could evenings and weekends shooting images um, building up a portfolio um, and then I started to get my name out there by entering awards, um, writing for magazines and that sort of thing um, and then in 2003 um, I was made redundant from my job and that's when I went took the dive into doing full, for wildlife photography full-time um, and it's gone okay ever since although it's changed a lot from those days because that was obviously back in the film days um, it was just when digital was first starting to come out um, but I thought today that I'd share some of my favourite images that I've taken locally. Um, and although, obviously, I, I travel a lot within my work, travel all over the world, but I still think that there's a real value in, in work, working in, on your local patch, as it were. You know, um, I, and I find that most of my successful images, or, or, you know, probably the majority of them have been ones that I've taken within a 20-mile radius of where I live. Um, and I think that's the case with a lot of photographers and I don't think it's a coincidence. I think concentrating on an area that I'm able to return to time and time again can be, can be beneficial in several ways. Um, first of all, you learn so much more about the wildlife firsthand. Obviously, it's very important to study the, study the habits of the, of the subject before going out, you know, from books, from the internet, but it's, there's, it's no... Um, it's no substitute for putting the time in and actually going there, watching them firsthand, noting down patterns of behaviour. Um, and I find that as well as getting an in-depth in knowledge of the, of the subject, you also get an, a very deep knowledge of the places itself um, and about the light and about how it changes throughout the day, even throughout the year. Um, and it, it, you're able to suddenly sort of visualise images. You can see see how the backgrounds are going to change as the as the year progresses, um, where the subjects are likely to be and what images are possible. Um, so this first picture is a, a mute swan taken literally 200 yards from where I live. There's a big lake. Um, it's somewhere I've been photographing the birds there for, you know, it, well over 20 years. And it's just over that long period that I've been, been able to spend so much time there that I know exactly where the sun's going to rise at what time of the day. Um, where the subjects are likely to be um, and a lot of the time I, in my work I try and not necessarily go in full frame really tight on the subject I like to pull back and include the environment in the shop I think that really tells us a story about the subject um, and, and it can create a really interesting interesting view we have the next one please this is another image taken again locally to where I live uh, it's actually taken at a, a deer location where there's a lot of red deer, but there's also brown hares. Um, we had one day, or well, two days in fact, um, one year where the, we had a lot of very late snow, a um, lot of blizzards conditions, and it lasted for a couple of days. So I went there with the intention of photographing the deer, um, but on arrival, there was all the deer were very huddled together because of the cold. It's very difficult to isolate them and get a nice shot. Um, so I was just wandering around and I, I noticed this brown hare in the in the grasses and I actually sat down first of all laid the camera down almost flat and I just waited um, normally I would try and approach the subject very very carefully of course um, stopping um, in intervals and trying to get close but on this occasion I just thought I would just stay still um, and eventually the hair just wandered forwards into this clearing um, and I was able to capture it against the snowflakes and I think that's a lot of Another thing that I like to do in my work is to capture an element of weather to the picture. And again, I think that immediately 
immediately conjures up an atmosphere um, and it tells you it's particularly snowy weather winter is actually my favorite season for photography and I think as soon as you've got that harsh winter weather um, you're, you're showing a different side to the subject you're showing that a much more um, you're showing that the conditions that it has to face so again it tells a story about the subject and it it's, gives you a much more extreme look on the on the subject uh, next one please um, another another thing that I like to do a lot, and that it's something I've experimented more since digital has come out, is capturing motion. Um, and I feel like to convey a real sense of motion and energy in the shot is um, a way of capturing the essence of the subject. Um, so I, I obviously, for this shot, I dropped the shutter speed very slow down to about a thirtieth of a second. Um, this is a black-headed gull, again taken same place as the swan, so two minutes down the road for me. Um, so I can take advantage of the of the best of the light. Um, this was taken just as the sun was sinking um, against a dark, an area of shadow um, and I underexposed the shots by about two stops in camera um, and that's eliminated all the distractions out of the background so it's just gone jet black the background um, and we all need a bit of luck sometimes and it was that was the case here when I was as I was firing a sequence of shots as the bird was hovering um, a swan came and landed on the water and created that sort of rippling wave at the bottom of the frame. So that was a, a welcome piece of luck there. Uh, next one, please. So this shot was taken, again, very local within 10 miles of my house. Um, and I always look at the very carefully at the weather forecast because, of course, we know we all know how important light is in photography. It's, it's something that I see as pro possibly the most important thing of all. Um, and I always try and venture out after a clear, cold night because then there's a good chance there's going to be mist in the mornings um, in this particular area. There's, it's, it can be really magical atmosphere in the mornings. You've got the mist shrouding the forest. As the sun comes up, you get these big beams of light cutting through the trees and it, it creates these pools of golden light. Um, and it's a way of, I think, creating an immediate connection with the viewer. As soon as you see something like this, you, you're immediately flooded with those feelings. Um, and at first I was, I was, I could see the deer and it was behind the tree on the left. Um, and I almost went towards it, but I just stopped myself because I could see a composition there with the big tree on the left and the, and the shadows on the right um, as acting like a natural frame to draw your eye into the, into the shot. So I, Again, as I did with the hair, I just stood there, stood still and just waited. Um, and eventually the deer just wandered forwards into the clearing and I was able to, to backlight it, to reveal the black breath of the deer against the dark background. Can we have the next one, please? This is a, one of my favourite winter shots taken in the Peak District, um, where I live in the UK. I live in a, in a small village, but it's right on the outskirts of the Peak District National Park. So we have some... Uh, some amazing landscapes there we've got so it's sort of divided into two sections you've got the dark peak which is the northern areas where it's very desolate moorland gritstone outcrops um, where you get and then in the white in the south it's known as the white peak where you've got limestone dales rivers much more wooded much more green um, so it's quite nice because you've got these this real difference in in not only the landscape but the subjects that you find in each area um, this was actually taken one winter. I spent about two, two or three weeks during December just photographing this, these pair of barn owls that were hunting across the fields. Um, and I, again, as I said earlier, being able to go back to the same places time and time again, it gives you really invaluable information about the subjects and about their movements. So I was able to, by, you know, 10, 12 visits, I was able to predict the, the where the birds were going to hunt and um, their flight paths and it, it was a, I was able to then get myself into the right position for the shot um, and uh, the first few images were actually taken against just the snow uh, with no grass in the foreground but I saw the potential for this this foreground grass to, to again add some depth to the shot and to bring the viewer's eye into the picture so I, I just covered myself in some scrim netting material stood there so the camera was a lot lower to the ground um, and eventually it flew in the right, right direction and I was able to get it towards the camera with the grasses. Um, can we have the next one, please? Again, this is uh, another local picture, the same lake as earlier. So 
um, taken during a really heavy spell of snow. Um, and I spent, again, a full, full two days at the lake um, trying to capture the great crested grebes as they, as they display this amazing courtship, this courtship behaviour. Uh, they have various different parts to their courtship, but one is where they'll come together and they'll, they'll shake their heads at each other. It's an amazing thing to witness. Um, and I'd, I'd just had it in my mind. I was visualising this image of capturing the behaviour against the snowy landscape. So stayed there for a good, good day. Um, and most of the time they were too far out in the middle of the lake, couldn't get close enough, but then eventually a pair just drifted close enough. And again, I didn't want to go full frame. I didn't want to go too tight into the subject because I wanted to create this, wanted to give the subject room to breathe in the frame and to, and to get this expanse of snow falling around the birds. And I think that's, uh, again, it's a way of telling a story um, and connecting the viewer more with the picture. And we have the next one, please. Now, this is uh, one of my favourite deer images. Um, again, taken three miles away from where I live. Uh, there's a big forest area and big moorland area where you get red deer that uh, fight every, every year, obviously, during the rut. And it's an image that I'd visualised a, a lot in the past. I spent years and years trying to capture this shot, basically, with uh, two deer in, in full silhouette fighting. Um, and it, I think it took me over 10 years of going back to this same location every, every year during the, the rut before it all came together. Um, and I think that sums up a lot of, the, of what I mean by, um, you know, it's not just having the patience to sit there, it, it's perseverance as well. And it's, it's visualizing an image, persevering with it and going back to the same places again and again. And then hopefully eventually all the elements will fall into place at the right moment. And the, the still images that I have burned into my in my mind, which I haven't been able to get yet, which I'm still trying to get, um, and I'm sure one day that will happen. Um, but yeah, this is one of my favourite deer pictures. Um, and just uh, onto the next one, please. Um, this is the, the final one that I'll show today, and it's um, taken actually almost in my back garden. Um, there's a farm where I've got a, a feeding station set up, um, and I, I, I spend a lot of time there over winter, especially when you get a lot of snow falling, because then you get harsh weather brings in more birds. Um, so I've got basically a, but several bird feeders set up near to trees, and it's a great way of attracting the subject to you. Um, and and I, like I said, as soon as you get the harsh weather, you get more birds visiting the feeders, more birds visiting the area, and then you get more, more squabbles breaking out. Um, and I've always, within my work, as well as you know, using the light, um, I've always tried to capture the decisive moment. Um, and it's a phrase that uh, a photographer in the 20s or 30s coined Henry Cartier-Bresson, on a street photographer. Um, and it was, it refers to the moment the, that everything comes together that represents that perfect moment. And I think um, we can all see that in the natural world around us all the time, but, but you've got to be there, you've got to be there with the camera ready. Um, and this, this, this actually happened when a, the lot, these are long tailed tits that we, fairly common bird that we get in the UK. Um, but one flew in from the right and it, they sat on the perch next to each other and then they just started squabbling and one took off and hovered just for maybe one second, two seconds and I fired a burst of frames, um, captured the, the moment um, with a little blur in the wings. Um, and I think it's, it sort of incorporates a lot of what I look for in my work. You've got the, the uh, composition with the line of the, the branch leading through the shots. Um, you've got the element of weather with the falling snow um, to give that feeling of extreme climate. Um, and then of course, you've got the moment of interaction between the two birds. Um, and that's, that was the last one. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. That was fantastic. Michelle, are you, are you set? <laughs> I sure hope so. <laughs> and I realize I've taken some time, so I will, I will go through this uh, rather quickly. So what I was going to say is that we've got till we've got till 45. So that's seven or eight minutes max. I've been told that I've got to finish firm at seven o'clock local, which is 23 minutes from now. Okay. Okay. I got my timer set. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. So um, this spring we went for a walk and uh, my husband said, oh, look, there's a, there's a fox in the field. 
just on the other side of the ravine from behind us. And one of the things that I had always wanted to, to photograph is, um, is a fox. And as Ben said, it's, it's one of those visualizations that were visuals that I had wanted to achieve over the number of years. And it was just finding that right opportunity. So when uh, it was spotted, I ran home, I got my camera, I went back out. Obviously, I spooked um, the poor mom away. I was devastated. And I, and I kept going back. And one of the things that um, that it was to my benefit is because I had the time, because I was able to just go around the corner and I photographed with a long lens with an 800 millimeter from my car, um, it took a few days for me to, um, to get her accustomed to my car being there. And eventually with the time that I had with her, I was able to, um, to spend uh, much more time photographing her in these intimate moments. And she became almost trusting of me and my presence and understanding that I wasn't there to, to harm or, um, yeah, it was amazing because when you do, and you are able to have time with these animals, it's not only are you able to um, anticipate maybe the light, but also the interaction. And, and one of the things that I'm constantly trying to do is create that emotional impact um, with my photos. So it's that interaction between the mom and the pups and, and the fun uh, that they were having. And um, yeah, it was a real blessing for me. And, and one of those things that it just happens right behind your house. And it felt like it was, it was mine, you know, because uh, it was just such a gift and something that, um, that I spent the, the next few days uh, going out at five o'clock in the morning, just waiting for her to return with a, with a meal, whether it was a raven or um, it was the crow, there was uh, squirrels, um, just, yeah, connecting with that animal or those animals, especially with that mom fox, being able to have her look my direction. And that connection is something that is so unique and beautiful and something that is uh, so attractive and keeping me going back for more and more. One of the things that I do, um, we have a, a lake um, cottage and I typically go out in my kayak um, before the sun rises. And this year in particular, we had so much activity I would be overwhelmed with uh, four hours in my kayak coming back and we had uh, so much uh, different activity that I had seen in the previous years and I'm not sure because the lake was quieter, there was less traffic, less people on the lake. It was certainly to my advantage and I was able to spend time with this blue heron he would allow me to just follow along. And one of the things that I'm doing uh, on my kayak is I'm photographing with mirrorless. And I believe that being able to photograph with a silent shutter, you're able to spend more time with the animals with less dis disturbance and interference. And you just become one um, with these creatures. I photographed a lot of our loons on the lake over the years. And, uh, you know, this was a morning that I thought that nothing was really going to happen for me. And of course, every wildlife photographer knows that there's a lot of disappointment as well as a lot of reward. And uh, with all the patience that you put in, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you're going to be um, a, a gifted with an encounter. And at one point I thought um, that it was just a loon coming up in front of me. He was fishing. Um, then the mate came up. I thought it was the mates and then they went back down and all of a sudden, you know, because I have spent so much time with the loons and watching their behavior, I knew that there was something different going on. And, uh, and then they both bolted out of the water and they had this full on, uh, full on territorial fight. And if you can see the beak around the other, the other loons neck, everything happened so quickly. And of course, you know, you have to be ready and aware of, of your surroundings at all times as wildlife photographers. And um, I was just so happy that it happened as, as close as it did for me. Um, one of the things that I've been doing is shooting with the two times extender with the 500, uh, which has proven to give me quite great results. And in the past, I haven't necessarily been a two times ex you know, extender kind of gal. Um, I've kind of stayed away from extenders. And as much as I love the environmental shots, I also love getting in close when you can actually see this kind of behavior. Um, it was uh, it was amazing that it wasn't it wasn't the head wasn't taken taken off. Um, 
Again, with the with the extender, these were all taken uh, going in close, seeing the hands of, of the raccoon and, and hearing and watching this little creature eat on the shorelines was pretty, pretty cool. And she was very trusting of me. And again, it's taken some time. I think it's the same raccoon as that I've seen in the previous years. And uh, being on my kayak and being silent and, and just being one with the animals has created some pretty amazing encounters. The green heron on the left, um, we found out from Intel on the lake where, where, they were, um, uh, where they were, I had never seen the green heron so close and personal. And, uh, and then again, the osprey coming back from a morning on the lake and thinking that I wasn't having such a great day and then saw a white head on top of the tree. And uh, I thought it was the eagle at first and then it flew off right as soon as I approached and, and flew off behind me and then went into the, um, you know, dunked into the water to get a fish. And of course I was facing the wrong way. And I was so disappointed because I just couldn't get around in time. But then it flew away and then, um, and then circled back and then landed in the tree right next to me and began to eat its, uh, its fish and, and then fluffed off its feathers and, just love the light and, and the interaction and the eye to eye contact. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about being this close is, uh, is having that eye to eye contact. As I mentioned, we're in Canada, it's autumn, uh, it's amazing. This is just a, a few hours away from me. I've explored Algonquin Park in the last little bit. Um, it's actually eye candy. It's amazing to see these colors. I don't know, for some reason, I think that they're more beautiful this year than, uh, than previous years. And uh, it's just a delight. And I've been there to try to photograph the moose and I've been skunked. I've been um, left with days uh, in the field trying to find the moose in the rut. And uh, I've of course walked away with sometimes nothing, but in the last couple of times um, that I've gone, uh, just a few days ago, actually, I was able to see this beautiful female in the meadows. And while I was photographing her, I had a raven land in the in the grass just close to it, close to where we were standing, and uh, turned my attention to the raven for a short time, and uh, and he flew off, and I thought, okay, I'll go back to the moose. And then something in the corner of my eye caught my attention. And I looked, and and this raven had landed just mere feet away from from where we were. This is full frame. It's taken with the 500 with the two times that I was using for the moose because she was such a distance away. And uh, it was pretty incredible to have this uh, close encounter with the, with the raven. Started preening himself. It was very comfortable. It was a very, very neat experience for me. And I'll just finish with this, uh, these mating uh, um, moose. Um, just being able to see the, the female eating away and the other male uh, behind watching intently. Uh, you could see that he was distracted from, um, from the trees behind. He actually left her. So when he left her, we realized that maybe there was a potential other male in the, in the forest. Again, just watching the behavior is so incredibly important for, for your successes. And, um, hoping for for the right interaction and so the female ended up leaving and then we followed where the male went into the into the trees and sure enough there was another bull moose so we watched this interaction between this older moose and this younger moose and obviously the big older uh, male it was dominant and uh, and ended up with the with the with cow but just in the last moment, um, we, she, he had disappeared into the bush and then all of a sudden came back out, heard the rustling of the, of the trees and all of a sudden it appeared. And this is one of the, the coolest photos for me that I, that I got from this trip a, a, a number of uh, times ago. He came out of the tree and, uh, and revealed himself with a tree on him. <laughs> and uh, he had been obviously, um, uh, working his dominance against the other the other moose and and he came out with a full tree um on top of his antlers in his head so anyway my apologies i know i've gone over my time and i'll leave you with that and my sincere apologies again for my presentation not working Um, James no, and uh, Ishma? I think. Yes, we hear. 
Yeah. Uh, can we start the uh, inaugurate the exhibition? Can we both of you we walk certainly us can. It? We certainly can. I was just going to say thank you to Michelle and thank you to Ben. Very contrasting styles, but really emphasizing the importance of getting to know your backyard, understanding what's there, and exploring the beauty that is really, really close very often to home. Also emphasizing the importance of patience. 10 years to get a shot is a very long time. Um, <laughs> thank you both. Thank you both indeed. Okay, so uh, I think the last part of the evening is the inauguration of our exhibition. I think that's going to be displayed to the screen now so that those of you on the call with us uh, live can, can enter the virtual room with us, but please do make time after the call is finished to uh, look at the images on your own uh, more slowly. Um, you've heard from me and from Ishwar a little bit about what we were hoping to do. We've got images from the marine environment. We've got obviously lots of images from land. We've got uh, macro work. Um, we've got images from at least three, if not four continents. Um, and uh, it's been a huge amount of fun pulling it together. With that, I will end my chairmanship. I will hand over to Ishwar and invite him to offer uh, remarks and uh, hopefully the virtual room will appear on the screen. Yes, I'm going to screen share and uh, we can just run through the exhibition right away. I'll get started. Uh, Professor Ishwar, do you want to share screen or do you want us to do it? Anything is fine. Okay, so uh, we have shared screen and you can probably start explaining. As... I can't explain, it's just uh, we just want to run through this. Yeah, 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 exactly, just run through it. Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, can I do my screen scan? I think it's better if I can do it. Yeah, sure. Kotichi, can you please stop sharing screen? Uh, is it visible? Yeah, we can yes. see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this, uh, the link will be shared in the group. Uh, so there are two ways to get into the screen. So you can, there are, there is the enter exhibition or you can take the start guided tour. Start guided tour will take you one photograph at a time. Or you can enter exhibition, you can, you can scroll or you can walk through the exhibition on your own. Okay, so let me enter through Start Guided Tour. Okay, so this will take you to the first page. It will give you a brief insight about the exhibition. Okay, it goes on auto scroll. It keeps going like a automatic screen share. Yeah, like a PPT presentation it goes one after the other. So this is from James, what you can see, the bunny. And uh, you can pause anytime, you can, you can read more about it, you can see. Click on the right side button, right top corner to pause the tour, okay? And then you also have, you click on the image, you have the eye information. You click on the information for more information regarding the photograph. It's a wonderful photograph of the osprey but you can see the splash, the eyes of the osprey with a sheet of water over it. A fantastic shot by James. Uh, okay, so you can click on that. And you can also click on the bottom right corner. Okay, there is a navigation. Next, you can pause. Okay, and uh, also there's a previous. Okay, to go back. And this is how you scroll through the exhibition. Um, or So this is one by one. So I will go back and show you if you had to do it on your own. Okay, I'm going to refresh. Okay. And
and say enter exhibition. Okay, so there is a way for you to navigate. There's a instruction on your right. Click and drag to rotate the camera. Okay, so you can use your mouse or the keyboard to navigate through the exhibition hall. So let me click on my mouse. I go in slowly. Okay. So you move left, you move right. Okay, that's how you go in. Now I'm going to use my keyboard. Okay. And that is Ben's image. So you want more information? A mouse click goes to the image and a fantastic shot by Ben. And uh, you want to exit out. Okay. That's how you, you press the bottom arrow. Okay, you move around. So we have different walls here. So these are my set of images. This is Anoop's image of under, underwater photography, marine photography. Okay. So this has been curated by uh, Mr. James and myself. Um, so this is my wall here. You can see my photographs here. Okay. And I'm just moving around. I'm moving to the next hall here. Okay, and I use the mouse and the keyboard intermittently. And these are Jan's images here on the right wall. Okay, at any point of time, you can go and click on those images to get more information. For example, I clicked on that, it goes right there. Okay. So that is a brief tour about how you go about going to the exhibition. So the link will be shared with you. So you can take your own time and uh, go through the exhibition. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much, uh, James and Professor Ishwar. The, the, uh, the exhibition looks absolutely great. Thank you to both of you and to all of our photographers who have made this happen. The link is on our website and uh, I hope everybody can will go and visit the gallery and also spread the word about it. I now call upon Mr. Vijay Kumar, President of the Heritage Trust, to say a few words. Over to you, Uncle. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience participating in all the work that uh, Heritage and uh, the Center for Soft Power has done so far. Uh, for the past 25 years, Heritage has been doing some wonderful work, though it practically functions like a one-man show with uh, the Secretary Vijay Lakshmi managing most of the events and the programs during the year. What originally started off as a cause to assist various programs, whether it was funding the army or uh, working for Cargill or uh, taking children out on nature trips, engaging them with flora and fauna and teaching them aspects of life that was not normally included in school curriculum. We have since then come a long way. Now, Gudiya Sambrama that Heritage does and the Srishti Sambrama that we do in tandem with the b &M College, this has garnered enormous amount of support from the public and the participants, and it has gone from strength to strength in each passing year. And we feel delighted that today we are a standard bearer for others to uh, emulate and follow and do similar work in whichever sphere of life they are engaged in. So it's wonderful, and uh, the last few months have been extremely encouraging and we are as happy as we think the participants have been in, in uh, engaging with us and we look forward to doing 
more and more programs in the years to come and in the months to come, especially during COVID, most of the contact that we can possibly have is only online and through webinars. And that is where we are engaged in currently. And the team that is assisting uh, Vijay Lakshmi has done some phenomenal job. And we hope you're as excited and as happy as we have been in showcasing all these events for all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And uh, we will now be going to our next session. Uh, we welcome uh, Sri Vikram Greval, uh, Sri uh, Iba Talukdar, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Upasana Ganguli. Uh, it has been really nice that you all accepted to uh, participate with us. And uh, we thank this entire uh, panel who has been with us and uh, all the photographers who have exhibited with us. I hope you will all uh, you know, go there, look at the exhibition and also share it with everybody.